Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the LaRouge Rugby Podcast. My name is Dan Murphy, and with me always, fantastic Derek Brissett and the wonderful Stu Hardy. Gentlemen, happy uh, International Women's Day. Uh, we are recording the day after, but I think that uh, as a podcast, especially with... Um, We've had some amazing now uh, women on our show from uh, uh, Iroquois Roots Rugby, and they did a fantastic job that we want to take the time to acknowledge all of the amazing women in our sports. And um, I shared on the Lulu's Rugby uh, Twitter account just a helpful infographic about what we can do as men to support women's rugby in the world. Um, it's, it's pretty easy. There are so many things that we can do. Take part as a coach, coaching women's rugby. Um, support them by watching their games. There, there's just so many options for us as men to, to take our part and help grow their game. Um, so please take your time to uh, go to the Twitter account and see that and then uh, give it a quick little read. Now, gentlemen, we have a uh, tall task ahead of us because uh, we are like like less than two weeks away to the uh, new, new MLR season. So we are going to start... Uh, by going over the West coast um, because holy moly, there is a lot to talk about. There are a ton of new signings. There's a new team. There's, there's lots to go through, but the first thing is that <laughs> we're pretty lucky that we, since we moved to Tuesday, a lot of things have been kind of being announced Monday, Tuesday, either from LR, MLR or the arrow. So the big first thing that we got to talk about is that TSN has announced that they are re upping their, partnership with the Toronto Arrows and becoming their broadcasting partner once again. We got a small taste of the relationship last year, you know, unfortunately, you know, four or five games and that's, that was it. And then they did some of the arrows in the hour kind of stuff, which was fantastic. But um, is there anything that we want to see grow into this year from their, you know, work that they did last year? Yeah. Like, I mean, I think one of the most disappointing things about the way the season in 2020 ended was that we were realistically like, I think I'm trying to remember what the actual schedule was, but I think like two weeks away from getting MLR games nationally broadcast, like on TSN or whatever. Right. Like they were mm-hmm. been on, they were going to be on the, like the main TSN network and stuff. So I think, you know, I can't wait to hopefully like that will, come to fruition um i love honestly like i think being on tsn is brilliant it's obviously it's one of the two biggest sports networks in canada which is great because that to me the most important thing about that is that just your average sports fan will pay or is already paying for tsn and by having mlr on tsn it it increases just the chance that it's like they stumble like new fans will stumble across it because it's on a platform that's so easily accessible i think like, I don't know if, the, like, what I would want to see more out of necessarily. Um, just, like, if the games end up on TV, like, that's the thing that I'm most excited about because that just increases, like, you know, hopefully, I mean, maybe weird talking like this, but, you know, in a post-COVID world and stuff, if the games are on TSN, you know, that increases, like, hey, maybe, you know what I mean? Maybe, like, there was, like, an afternoon baseball game or afternoon hockey game or something depending on the time of the year and it's like tsn's playing that and then it rolls into you know if you're at a bar or something the next thing that comes on happens to be an arrows game and now you have people in a bar watching rugby because it just happens to be on the tv right um and i think things like that things like that are what i get really excited about from tsn i think too like tsn wanting to do things like arrows in an hour like kind of willing to go out and you know, ask for and get rugby content created for them. Um, I think ultimately, like, I don't, I don't really know if it would be feasible or necessarily even has anything to do with the arrows broadcasting deal, but I would just like to see like, you know, it'd be cool if like TSN's website started kind of adding a little bit more as I think we talked about this before, get like a rugby column or something like on like the top page or make it a little bit more visible in like the other sports section or something. Um, I think that would be great. Um, but... They did a great job when the World Cup was going on. That, that yeah, was one exactly. of the things, right? Like, that would be really cool. Exactly, yeah. So it's, like, more things like that. Like, just make it – like, I just want – like, I hope – I guess my ultimate hope out of the deal with TSN and stuff beyond, you know, games being broadcast um, on 
you know, either their app, their website, or just on like the TV network is, you know, hopefully it gets to a point where it's like, you start seeing like major league rugby stories and stuff like that popping up on their, uh, like, you know, on their, like their newsfeed, things like that. Um, I think that would be kind of like the ultimate, but I guess, you know, part of that is like the arrows in major league rugby kind of proving to TSN now that you have a full season to do it, right? Like how viable this is, how many people are watching it and stuff. And I mean, ultimately, like, I hope I would encourage everyone to be like, do like, do your best, like tune into TSN, make sure you like bump the ratings up. I mean, if for some reason you have something that's so important that you have to miss an arrows game for, like, I don't know, leave the TV on in your house, just turn it on to TSN. So it bumps up that rating a little bit. Um, and then rethink your life because why are you missing arrows games? But that's besides the point, get your priorities straight, watch every arrows game live. Um, but like ultimately, yeah. Like I just hope I just hope people tune in. I hope new fans especially tune in and are able to find the games on TSN. And you know, I like their cover. I like the way it worked out last year. Thought it was great. Had like it's uh you know club like club rugby on TSN is not a thing that we get super often. And obviously now you have the like they had the uh, the super rugby rights, but now there's all that weirdness of um not nobody in North America is able to watch this the super rugby this year which is just another conversation entirely but but like i mean i think like tsn showing interest in rugby obviously they're the world cup broadcaster canada broadcaster too so yeah i mean hopefully you know it's hopefully it's successful for them and it kind of encourages tsn to you know add more rugby to it like maybe pick up a couple of the maybe try to get you know maybe fight to get super rugby a little bit harder or even be like wonder if like hey yeah, get the uh the pro 14 or, or i guess pro 14s with dozen premierships with sportsnet and then i guess it would be uh like i don't know maybe get top 14 top 14 top yeah 14 would be cool um but like you could yeah like go around do that pick up slar maybe that'd be fun too like i don't know how i don't know if you can do that um but like yeah maybe it just but like i think ultimately it's just the best way to get to like to get more rugby coverage and more rugby in the media is to just consume what's there already and show that you know you'd be willing to get it so you know hopefully you know everybody tunes into tsn watches those arrows games like i said if not maybe just uh maybe you accidentally left your tv on when you left your house and you can bump some ratings a little bit um because those will always be fun too but like I'm excited to just at the prospect of you know one of the one of the biggest sports networks in Canada playing Major League Rugby and it's like it's something we would have got last year but with the way the season ended it 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 didn't so it's like you know seeing it become official again it's like it has me just as excited as it did last year because I, I think it really is a key thing in getting the sport to grow within Canada. So for any Brits that are listening or watching like myself. Uh, TSN would be the equivalent of BT Sport. So this is a pretty big deal, especially for the Arrows and the MLR. Um, one thing that I would like them to do is follow a format similar to the World Cup Final, as opposed to what they did for the World Cup Group Games, which was just take the global feed and then do nothing else. It was when it came to the World Cup Final when they had... Um, people in the studio, there would be the host, there would be guests as well. I think maybe even include some form of analysis. So in like the bill, why did this try succeed? Um, how is the defense working? Why is this player being chosen as a uh, man of the match? Those kind of things, because then that information that's then passed on to the viewers will allow more people to understand the intricacies of rugby so you can appeal to them in that sense and make them more knowledgeable about the game but without like dumb it uh talking down to them from like a point of intellectual authority. yeah just just learning about the technical stuff like it's yeah. easy to pick up like like rugby like you pass the ball backwards and you run and there's a scrub and a line out and like anyone can really un understand how the, the the game goes after that but it's the little technical pieces it's like yeah well why why did they kick there or you yeah. know why like guys i'm always going to bring it back to curling but you oh know watching God. watching the, the hey, block you know what we got week, we got what six minutes into this episode we're getting better we got six minutes in. um 
but you know, my wife is a much, uh, much larger, uh, curling fan. She's been to curling, you know, since she was a little, little, little spot. Um, I'm always kind of asking her, well, why do they do that? Why are they, why aren't they doing this? And I think that Stu, you're right. I mean, uh, Brian Spanton and, uh, Gareth Rees, uh, were kind of the, 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 the go-to analysts for, for rugby Canada on TSN for some of them, their ARC games. And they had them, you're right at the world cup final. So I would love to, uh, to have that as well. I'd also just like to see, and it's kind of simple. We know that the agreement is now start showing some ads. Like that, yeah. that would be really cool right now that I'm, uh, you know, a lot of like the, the briar right now is going on right now. I would yeah. love to see a Toronto arrow ad right now, or, you know, people are tuning into a Leafs game, Toronto arrow ad, or, you know, anything sports center. Like let, let's, Let's start to see that ramp up a little bit. And you know, that, one, that would, maybe it doesn't happen this year, but if this is going to be a relationship that's going to grow, like throwing those ads in would be, be really cool to see. Yeah. I think um, like Austin did that with like a, like I think like, a, like one of the, like the Monday night football games or something yeah. like that. Like whatever the, uh, I'm trying to, I don't know. I don't want to, I'm probably going to screw up my Texas geography. I'm trying to figure out if the Cowboys or the Texans would actually be closer to Austin, but um, it was like one of their games or something, I believe, and they. I will pull up the map. Oh, all right. But it was um, the Gill Texans, obviously, and the. Uh, um, but yeah, as in they advertised in front of one of the largest. Yeah, they went after television. It, like, yeah. They went after it. Yeah, they went after it. Okay. So, yeah. uh, oh, it's kind of like a weird triangle. So I would. I don't want to do the actual like math. <laughs> just guess ballpark it uh probably houston probably houston if you're from austin let us know what nfl team you cheer for um <laughs> something weird probably probably like the cow of uh, the uh the packers or something just because austin's so weird yeah <laughs> all right well the other bit of news that was announced uh today uh was that mlr has selected genius sports group as the official sports betting partner um now coming just going off that that doesn't really understand what the kind of relationship is going to be. Um, but MLR has granted uh, GSG uh, the rights to capture, manage, and distribute the league's official data with sports books across North America and worldwide. Um, we know that there is interest in regular betting on our matches, and we have to take proactive measures to safeguard the integrity and transparency of our events, said uh, Commissioner Killebrew. We will have the utmost confidence in the GSG to manage our data and deliver to the sportsbook partners, further engaging all fans, old and new. Um, so this group um, has worked with the PGA, English Premier League, and I guess over hundreds of other leagues worldwide. Um, so this is, to me, the, the first step leading to this is, oh my goodness, does this mean that we're finally going to get a robust fantasy? Like <laughs> my heart is racing when I when when. Uh, I think uh, Derek threw this into our chat. I'm like, this is great. Um, but I want to get your guys' opinion. I'm going to go to you, Derek, uh, because you were kind of chatting about this with Andrew Ferguson on Twitter, uh, about how you have some degenerate friends, according to him. Uh, but how is this going to change the fan experience of Major League Rugby? Um, well, first of all, Andrew Ferguson is 100% correct. My friends are degenerates. Um, and... I think this is going to be great for Major League Rugby and for my degenerate friends. And hopefully my degenerate friends will become fans of Major League Rugby as a result of it. I think, like, to me, obviously, like, I try my best to get people to, like, watch rugby all the time or whatever. Like, I'll bring it up and be, you know what I mean? Like, if if we're around friends and stuff, I'll, like, try to, like, pull up game highlights and things like that. Try to convince people. It probably annoys my friends to a certain degree, but I I just want them to enjoy this great game. Um, and you know, I've often had like some conversations, like, I mean, like I went to school for sports management. I used to work for an OHL team, used to work at the hockey hall of fame. A lot of my friends, a lot of my coworkers are just people that are just diehard sports fans and not even this, like, you know, we're a huge fan of like hockey and only hockey, like people that are like, they watch literally everything. Like if it's an athletic competition, like they will watch it. Um, and I think, you know, in hearing 
like I'm always trying to be like, like, what would it take to like get you to watch Major League Rugby or get you to, you know, become interested in it or become invested in it or to like, you know, even to be like to pick a team and just be like, fo- watch their 16 games, follow them throughout the year. Um, and the two responses that I always get are always just one, can I play fantasy? And two is, can I bet on it? And I think Major League Rugby is doing well to like, you know, opening the doors to be like, yeah, like get into like the sports books and stuff. Because I think like last year, like at the Vegas tour, like um, Major League Rugby, a lot of their staff and a lot of like the fans and stuff stayed at the Westgate Hotel, which was is one of the biggest. I believe it is the biggest sports book in Las Vegas. And like you couldn't bet on the Major League Rugby games that were happening down the street in Las Vegas in like the biggest sports book in the world. Um, and I think ultimately, I think, like you said, Dennis, like, I think that by encourage or like, by like kind of, you know, allowing a company like uh, genius here to like, you know, have that data, distribute that data. Like even, I think it just helps like intro, like attract new fans to the sport. And obviously like, if you're already a fan, it gives you a new way to kind of engage with it too. Right. But I think, like ultimately like fantasy and gambling and betting on sports is a massive way to get people like actually involved and interested in it. And I mean, I'm sure like, you know, I'm sure we've all been at some point in our lives, like, you know, I mean, in like at work and someone wants to do like a social thing and it's like, you know what the world cups on, here's like a world cup box pool or something or like the NHL playoffs are happening. Yeah. So here's like one of those, like, you know, office pools.com. And here's like the little like quick thing you can fill out. You got to pick like a, of three, you get nine boxes. You have to pick one player out of each box or whatever. Right. And it's like, I'm sure like at some point we've all been involved in one of those. And it's just like, you put in like whatever money, but it, it's like, even if you're not completely interested in the sport, because now your friend was like, Hey, do you want to be in this pool? Or, Hey, do you want to, you, do you want to do this or whatever? Now you're like paying attention to it. Like, even if you like, I'm not a soccer fan. The only time I ever watch the world cup is when someone's like, Hey, do you want to like join do the, a pool? Like, you you want to yeah. do this pool? And I'd be like, can I win money? And I'd be like, all right, sure. I'll do this pool. Like, why not? Right. And it's like, and I think that's kind of what you kind of open the door to. And even like, honestly, like, even if you're just like, Hey, like, you know, sometimes you're just like, sitting at home and it's like you know if you're like scrolling through like one of the betting websites or whatever and you maybe you stumble across rugby and be like ah sure why not bet on it and then just be like oh I'll, well now that i bet on it i might as well go watch it or whatever right um and people do do that so um it's like i think ultimately it's like it's a good way to attract new fans it's a good way to engage new fans and like you even like and i think it also could help new fans too like say if you were to say for like sports betting purposes like we're about to do like a western conference preview on this show but it's like you could do something like like you know what i mean like if you're a new fan and you've never watched it maybe you're not necessarily interested in gambling on it but you could maybe like look at you know the toronto arrows have that new thing with cool bet right that's going to be like they're going to be their sponsor on the back of the jersey so maybe like yeah if you're like you know, interested in rugby, you can like go to cool bet and be like, all right, like here's the odds for every team to win the MLR shield. And just by looking at the odds, it'll give you kind of an idea be like, okay, these four teams are like the favorites that are really good. It's like, okay, these teams are kind of at the bottom. They have really bad odds. They probably stink. And then there's a whole bunch of teams in the middle and it can kind of give you a little bit like as a new fan could help give you an idea of like where everybody's like stands going into the season. Same if you wanted to put like you could do all kinds of crazy prop bets and stuff too like with rugby but ultimately like i'm super excited because i think like and and of course dan you mentioned fantasy um like in order to like gambling to happen that means like i think one of those things that you know the league hasn't quite done yet but i think they want to do and i know they want to do it is get more stats and more information about the game actually out there um and yeah, like you said, it's like that, like that's how you get fantasy going. But it's like, I think you kind of, you like, you can make a lot of money. It can be a good source of revenue and stuff to help like, you know, um, it, like with, you know, having those ties with like gambling and stuff. And I think uh, like in this case, especially too, it's like, I think you just help open up doors to new fans and, you know, make the fans that you already have also be able to like engage 
with your league the same way they would do like the NFL or the NHL or something by playing fantasy and, you know, betting on betting on the game. So I think it's a great step forward for the league. So I'm not really the biggest gambler in the room or any room to be act. But um, one thing that I'm always interested in and you need to have gambling for it to happen is player stats. So it's always been yeah. the issue. And it was proven by ESPN Scrum last year when they announced that they would not be updating any of their records going forward. And people have been like trying to find out uh, player statistic from uh, clubs and stuff like or companies. And they said their only response has been that they would provide it if it was in relation to gaming or betting. Yeah. And now that this now seems to be in place, there's going to be a position going forward where you want to find out player stats, which are more than just the simple how many tries have they scored? How many tries have they assisted with? How many games have they won? It's a question of finding the smaller details that you're more interested in, like how many tackles made in the game? What's that? What's a player's average tackle rate over a season? Oh, for sure. Which can then be used if there's a gambling function behind it, just because me saying, oh, I want to find out the tackle rate of this player at the moment involves going back through all the games they've played in MLR, at least for so far, and then counting all the tackles they've made. Hmm. And that's an absolute a little bit of work for you. It's easier. A little bit. Yeah. You could probably ask somebody realistically. Um, Yes, but you would have to pay them. And where are we going to get the money for that through this gambling revenue that will be built? Yeah. Well, I so think... that's how that that's the positive that I'm looking for in all of this because that's the, like I said, I'm not really a gambler, but I am interested in statistics. And I know there's people out there who are like fans of rugby who don't gamble, but, but would be interested in finding out this information. And even if they make a fantasy team, which is purely fantasy rather than oh i'm you know i'm hoping i can make a lot of money from this and so you know it's good to have that information available and if gambling is the way that we get it then so be it yeah and i think like you know depending on how like elaborate and stuff it gets and i mean it might not happen right away i mean like maybe maybe this starts off with just being like pick a winner pick a like pick who's gonna win a match or whatever but like, I mean, you look at all, like other major sports leagues and stuff. Like, you can bet on things like, you know, over under this guy's score gets gets two and a half points tonight, right? So it's like you could do like, yeah, like you can make a bet, be like, yeah, over under Lucas Rumble has, you know, one or point five tries in this game, and you can just make a bet on whether or not Lucas Rumble scores a try, right? Like, and then. You know, or you can do like all the other stats and stuff. Like you in football, like like you can bet on like you know rushing yards and things. People were yeah, people were betting on the Super Bowl or on the uh, Super Bowl halftime show. Like you can bet on it on a whole bunch of things. Oh, man, like I mean, the Super Bowl is like the king of that. Like you can bet on the coin toss. You can mm-hmm. be like yeah, heads or tails, right? Which probably would mean that Major League Rugby would start have to after you did that would have to show the coin toss and stuff. But like, <laughs> um. I bet how many streakers are going to go through the Austin's home first home game, yeah. dude. That that is a prop bet at the Super Bowl, though. That does an. It is. Oh like, no, it is. On, yeah, bet on like the color of Gatorade and stuff. Like you can do a yeah. lot of things, right? Yeah, I um. But it's like, like even I first that, got into American football because of fantasy football. Like yeah, I 100%. watched like the Super Bowl, and that's it. and then like uh, my wife's family were are super big football fans, and they invited me into their like their fantasy league that they do, and I just got hooked. But, but it's because yeah, but of that fantasy that got me into the sport. That's exactly what I'm talking about, though. Like, yeah. that is, as, you know, why you need this. Like, why the league needs this. is exactly Yeah, because someone could be like, yeah, I'll pick John Ryberg from, yeah. uh, the, and then from L.A. And then they watch Johnny Ryberg all season going, yeah, come on. And then, you know, they learn yeah. more and more. And, and it's like in that first year that you do that, too, like even if your team sucks, you start watching. 
right like you start like you know what i mean like you, you start watching it or whatever right and that's the whole that's the whole point like that's why you do it um that's exactly why you need to do this is go so f- people like that that go to like their friends or their families and are just like hey you know what like hey like you know what we need one more like we we have 11 people in our fantasy league right now we need one more to make the numbers even do you want to join our I like our MLR fantasy. The season starts in three weeks. We're drafting next Tuesday. Like, do you want to do it or whatever? And then you get more, and that's how you grow some fans and stuff too, right? And then, um, well, yeah. I mean, all ultimately, like, I feel like out of everything that like the league has announced so far, like over this off season or even in their history, this is the thing that has got me like the most excited. Like, I just. Because I think it's like it's an absolute 100 percent a key to like all fan engagement. You know, I don't know if <laughs> having this this game on. I don't know. You know, if you're on YouTube, you see the battle game from last season on, and I've got a picture in front of me, and I can see the game backwards, and like I feel like I'm gonna lose myself some point in this podcast episode. So I apologize in advance if the host suddenly just like loses himself. Just giving you guys a warning now. We'll be there to bring you back. I was just saying, All right, I awesome. Can tell you, I can okay, guys, well, you know what? Let's. I can tell you what happens if you want. Like, if it'll make you like less distracted by this game. I could tell you. You know what's funny is I think I remember what happens in this game. Ooh, this game's epic. But I'm gonna not want you. Don't tell me. This is the 2020. Yeah, don't don't tell me because I'm pretty sure. I, right. Yeah, yeah, I, and this is the one where Utah Utah wins, right? Like, don't they? So they you already come back and win it, anyways. All right. Epic. I'm actually right, planning anyway. on talking about this, this was, I just, in the episode, by the way. We'll talk about it later. That's fine. So going into our uh, our third season covering uh, Major League Rugby, we're, we're changing up how we do our season preview. Um, last year, we did an American team's uh, preview, and then we just did a whole episode about the air. Teams that we're going to do a West Coast first and then go East Coast. So, gentlemen, we're going to go alphabetically. And we're going to start with the Austin Gill Gronies. Um, one of the more, one, I, in my opinion, one of the most interesting teams in this conference. Um, their MLR record is a four wins, one draw in 24 losses. I feel like that's going to get a little bit which it might, I think it's going to get a little bit better as well. Uh, key additions, Patty Ryan, tight head, Christian Osberg, lock, Pele Cowley, scrum half, Bryce Campbell's, Cole Davis, Canadian wing, Jeff Hassler, Canadian uh, center wing, and Connor, Connor Mooneyham, center wing, playing him at fullback. Like the guy's a utility player; he he's everywhere. Um, and then in, in their roster, they have uh, Canadians. They have uh, Mo Abdul Monum at flanker, Cole Davis, Jeff Hassler, and Regan or Gorman Hawk. So, gentlemen, my key questions going into 2021 for the Gil Gronies are can all of their big signings gel to start the season? Because they did not have a great start to the season. You know, it was a, it was a rocky start in terms of cohesion. Um, and they kind of picked it up in the last couple of games, uh, finishing the season, but they just added a whole bunch of, like, I just had a, a good sized list. So, uh, Stu, I want you to answer this question first. Do you think that they're, big signs are going to be able to gel with the rest of the team? I think everyone's going to be in the same boat. They've been out of rugby for nearly a year now. Obviously, if some players have played, you know, in World Tens or I know that some players in other teams have done loan spells with other leagues and so on and so forth, but consistent professional rugby for everyone. Everyone's just like itching to get back on the field to start playing. So I think there's more camaraderie. I know when we talked to Jeff Hassler, he was talking about like how much he was enjoying being in Austin and with his new teammates. So I think things will gel together much quicker. We have to remember that also like less than two weeks before the season was to start, there was a major overhaul from Austin Hurd to Austin Gilgronies. There was this new kit that everyone was talking about. Um, and when we saw the kit for the first time, the names were peeling off the back of uh, the kit. It's so, a good symbolism for what was going on on the field. Oh, uh, no, um, absolutely. There's There were issues to be had on the field, but it's also worth remembering that 
when they were under the elite, they went an entire year without even drawing a game. It was loss after loss after loss. The fan numbers were declining with every single game until they went under this massive rebrand. And, you know, even just getting one draw in 2020, never mind the win they got against Houston, was a significant step forward. So, you know, co- going into the new season off a win, yes, that win was over a year ago, but it was a win nonetheless. I think there's go- there's a new mindset in Austin. There's a new uh, goal to focus on. They know they're not there to just make up the numbers. They know they're there to compete. And they will obviously, every team obviously is going to be wanting to say, oh, we want to lift the shield at the end of the season. But they are going to be the ones to say, we want to make a significant difference. We want Austin to be the rugby city in Texas going forward. Right. They want to put themselves on, back on the map and say, we are the AGs and we are here to win games and to entertain the fans. They uh they looked like they gelled pretty good on a Saturday night. So, <laughs> um, and uh, you know at least that was that's kind of like I guess the first time we got to see a little bit of their new look. And you could kind of see like the reaction on social media when they put out like their you know uh, what did they call it the team A and team G or the A team and the G team or something like that. Yeah. Um, but it's like you could kind of see like the social media reaction of the rosters where it was kind of like I think that was like the moment where people kind of clicked in like, ooh, like this this is not this is not the elite anymore. Like this is um a very talented group, a very stacked group, if that too. And I know like the team that Nola kind of put out to play against them, um, the you know, I think Nola kind of went with a little bit of a clear, like, you know first 15 second kind of 15 sort of strategy with that those mm. back, that split squad double header against Austin and then later against the Houston Sabercats um but you kind of look at the rosters and you look at like I think you look at those rosters and it's like Austin should smash that team and Austin did smash that team right and it's like I think that's one of those things where you kind of go out and like I, I mean it's weird it's weird I think like you say, like talking to Jeff Hassler, like you said, Stu, it's like there, there's a bit of a buzz, I think, with with that team um, right now. It's like they look like they're they're feeling pretty good. Um, you mentioned, obviously, like they finally got a win, um, you know, at the, end the, at the end of the season last year with the against the Houston Sabercats. And then they also, you know, Will McGee won the MLR virtual tournament. So they kept rolling with the victories. Um <laughs> Hey, they count, man. That counts. The only championship MLR gave out last year. Will McGee is the most. I suppose. <laughs> Will McGee is the most recent MLR champion right now. Um, just because just because it was a different format. Um, but I'm sure the Seattle Sea Wolves will not enjoy that argument at all. Um, but I think you kind of go that, and it's like, yeah, their preseason game they look good. I guess um, they play again on Thursday night, so I'd be interested to see it. And I mean, like, yeah, like. Dan, I know you kind of mentioned there's a lot of big new names, but it's like they kept a lot of... Yeah, and like, I, I wanted to bring that up here. because, you know, uh, Kurt Morath is back, uh, Marcello mm-hmm. Torrealba, uh, Will McGee, you mentioned him. Um, Zinzi- there are some pieces... Back. Yeah, oh. there, are, there are some pieces that have been around, especially those two in those two positions. Those are the, the yeah. playmakers. They, I mean, like, Frank, Frank Halai is back, Jamie McIntosh is back. Um, you know, I think like Roderick Waters, who I, I really, Waters, man, like yeah, Roderick Waters l- looked really good last year and it's crazy to be like, okay, like they actually added some wingers, especially in Hassler and Davis. So like, that'll be interesting for like how water season plays out too, but even like Frank Halai's back. And I think that's one of those funny things too. It's like, I feel like the, the Gilgrone is like just looking at like their roster and it's like, they kind of between Halai McIntosh and, I guess Isaac Ross, even though they haven't really said officially anything, but um, like yeah, they they just low key have three All Blacks on their team, or whatever. Mm-hmm. I feel like people don't don't necessarily mention that too often. Um, you know, guys like uh, Adam Ashley Cooper and Matt Gitto get all like the press and the publicity and stuff, but you know they uh, they got some really talented players like on their team, and they brought in you know a whole bunch of guys too, like you know Sebastian De Chavez. 
like you said, Osberg, man, they had like their off season was nuts too. Like, I don't know, like Sam, obviously new coach, Sam Harris. And I guess Sam Harris plays like 7D chess. Cause he ended up with like, you know, going into the draft, everyone was like, you know, Cam Dobson um, was going to, you know, could be the number one pick. <laughs> and then, you know, there's some questions there and he didn't end up going number one. So Connor Mooneyham ends up going number one to Dallas. And now they're both on Austin. So like you end up right. And so it's like, you got like the two best collegiate prospects in the country and they're both now on your team. Um, you know, just to kind of add to that depth, you got Christian Osberg came back. Um, Hassler, Dave, like it's like they made a lot of nice, really nice acquisitions. Bryce Campbell, too. Like, um, dude, like they, it's a good team, man. It's just like they're honestly like they're a scary good team. Like, and I think, and I think even like all their other guys that were there last year, and it's like, man, like they had good players. Like, I still think Mo Abdelmanim is probably one of the more underappreciated players in Major League Rugby. Like, he, um, I rem- I'm trying to remember the stat off the top of my head right now. I should have wrote this down, but it was like he was second in the league in steals, la- breakdown steals last year behind Cam Dolan. But Dolan played like something like over like two- I think it was like 200 more minutes or something than Mo, right? Like yeah. like Mo played the least out of all the guys mm-hmm. in the top five, and he was second, right? Um, and you know what I mean. And it's like I would love to see him get a little bit more time too. Um, Right. And yeah, man, that's, it's a good team, dude. Like it's a, like, I think there's, they're scary. I think they're like the days of Owen 16 are a thing of the past in Austin. I look forward to what they do this year. Yeah. And, and this was a question that we got online and I, I want to kind of talk about it quickly and they released their roster for their Thursday game against uh, oh, Houston. Yeah. And I want to give you guys the, just the backs at nine, and they kind of talk about this, that this is, uh, the assistant coach said, playing two quality sides in a three-day stretch allows us from a coaching perspective to test out a few in combination, but a more so it guarantees all the boys a final chance to put their hands up. So it sounds like this is definitely kind of a, like, uh, not some of the starters, but but here's, here's the, the list. Nine, Marcello Torrealba. Ten, Kurt Morath. Eleven, Cole Davis. Twelve, Mac Mason. Three, uh, Luis Setama, four, uh, Frank Halal, and f- uh, or four, 14. I was gonna say, what that's a weird decision to put them at 14. Sorry, 14, uh, Frank Halal, and 15, Connor Mooneyham. That is like they're like, we are resting some guys, like, there's no hassler, there's um, you're, you're not playing Will McGee, you're not playing Bryce Campbell. Like, do they have the best? best depth in the backs in the Western conference. Ooh, I mean, they're brothers in Los Angeles, um, which we'll talk about soon, have some pretty good depth. Um, I mean, yeah. So I, I like, I'm just actually pulling up this roster for the first time, stupid jobs, not letting me, you know, work getting in the way of what the important things in life, like looking at Austin's roster for a preseason game. Um, Tori Alba, Morath, Davis, Mason, Satama. Jeez. Oh, Dude, that is scary, man. That's actually, like, really good. Um, and then, like you said, but I'm like, okay, like, looking at it, like, okay, so their, their scrum halves are Tori Alba, um, Pele Cowley, Sydney Shoup. That's pretty solid. Their, um, like, their fly halves are, like, Kurt Morath, Will McGee, Mac Mason. Like, that's... Like, I mean, and even like we saw like I got Mac Mason playing playing inside center here. So like, you know, yeah, exactly. The, the, the Owen Farrell. They also had him like kicking in uh against Nola too. And he was um I think he missed one. What was he been like mm-hmm. one or like six for seven or whatever that would have been? Five for six, I'm not a but like they have that, like I mean the centers, Campbell, Halai, like Satama, Hodson, the wings. Halai obviously can play wing too. Davis Hassler, Mooneyham, who, like you said, is playing everywhere. Waters. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Like, we'll break. I, I think this, the question, like, does it come down to them or LA? I think, I think like LA's got that superstar talent, but I think like top to bottom, this might be better. What do you guys think? Or, well, or do you want to like go out 
or do you guys want to put up something like San Diego? Uh, I think San Diego's lost a lot of guys. I think they've lost a lot of pieces to to what was. If you had asked me last year, I would say like if I compared last year's San oh, Diego last- roster to this Austin of uh, this year, I would say it'd be a heck of a lot closer. Last, but last year's probably the best back line that's been. In yeah, the- but um, last year was the best back line. I don't think uh, there's much to compete yet against in the West. So, like, what do we, what do we think? Like, because I mean, obviously. I mean, I know we're going to get into a little bit of predictions and stuff later, but it's like, you kind of know this, they have like a really, they have like a really strong pack too. Like they have like, even like, like their locks are like, their locks are nuts with the Chavez, O'Gorman, Osberg, Ross, good back row and Abdelman, mm-hmm. Akina, um, DeWall, Dom Bailey, um, Cam Dodson, like I said too. Right, the front row's good. Yeah, like Macintosh, you know, Hugh Roach they just picked up. They got like the Crusaders strength. Mason Pedersen. Yeah. Mason Pedersen. They got the um Patty Ryan. They got this Crusaders strength and conditioning coach now, too. Yeah, like, they're they're gonna be like it's uh, what do you think? What do you think uh as this back line? I'm always cautious when it comes to a lot of talent as well as on the field as well because i think one of the issues you can find is that if you keep picking like the same guys over and over again and then the playing style becomes familiar for other teams that they're able to identify what needs to be done and then even if you're in the case of like okay we're gonna sub out this guy and this guy on like the 60 minute mark is that um, you may fall into a pattern of repetition and it may work for a few games, but if the eagle eyed uh, coaches from other teams are preparing to face you and say like round five or six, and they find out uh, where your team strengths are, no matter how deep it is, it can always uh, come back to bite you. So I think, I think they do have an incredibly uh, deep uh, back line. Uh, but I'm going to have to agree in the sense of what is, is it just talent or will it be experience as well? Because if you're talking about experience, then LA are definitely throwing their hat into the ring. And then it's a question of what's actually going to work in a match day scenario. Obviously doing these preseason games are definitely going to benefit them. I think this is going to be amazing for the coaches because being in a, it's a six day turnaround from their last game. Is that so? The last preseason. Game. No, they they like Austin. Yeah, they would have played on Saturday, and they're playing Thursday night now. So they're probably yeah. Because I mean, if you're listening to this when it comes out as planned, anyways, unless I screw up editing this or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, yeah, they should be playing. I guess tonight, if you're listening to this, well, like sometime during the day on Thursday. Okay, so. But that also puts them in good stead for, I'll be honest, I haven't been able to check the AG's full schedule, full schedule. but if they're playing Sunday uh, one week and then the next week they're playing Friday, to know which players are going to have the most optimal turnaround, this is an excellent means of doing so. Obviously, it's also going to benefit as well for being in like the same position. But their, it's, their game on Saturday was also only a fifty-minute game, too. Like it, it is, but in in the same sense of there will be players who have been in like a game scenario to then go into another game scenario in what I believe will be the shortest turnaround period in the in uh, the twenty twenty one season. So I believe it's going to benefit the coaches more than anyone else on the team. Well, let's stay within the state of Texas. Um, the Houston Sabercats, uh, they have a MLR record of 8 and 21. Uh, not much better than their uh, their friends in uh, in Austin. Um, they've made some some key additions. Um, Liam Murray, a Canadian, uh, Tian Erasmus, um, Nick Hilton Brand, another Canadian, um, Crosby Stewart, another Canadian. Uh, Vermanu uh, Diki Diki Ladi um, from uh, Fiji and another Canadian, Robbie Povey. 
So they, they've kind of uh, brought in a contingent of Canadians, especially from uh, the Pacific Pride program, which is, uh, which is fantastic. We love to see that relationship uh, building. Um, my question to you guys is, can they keep up with their rivals this season? Because, uh, and again, this is just kind of from my perspective, but it always seems that there is this like big brother, little brother relationship between Houston and Austin in their, their entirety up until really last year. Um, is that relationship changing? Well, I was going into the 2020 season thinking that the Sabercats could be the potential dark horse as of the Western Conference and, you know, could have gone the way to claiming their third place spot at the highest possible chance in uh, 2020, considering at the end of 2019, they were having like new head coach, new changes, and we're bringing in, they were finally bringing in the wins after, you know, having a mid-range season at best. Then they started off the 2020 season well with a win. That was about it. It was, it was just <laughs> losses after that. Um, I, I think because of like the ownership group with um, Austin, it's always going to be a case of, uh, Houston have to be careful with their finances. They have to know where they're being spent on. And, you know, maybe that can lead to a focus too on the more emerging American talent, be, uh, going to Houston and playing with more Americans and Canadians. Um, for example, Nick Hildebrand and Crosby Stewart are both from the Pacific Pride program. So this will be their first of uh, professional rugby in a full season format. So... You know, in a sense of, you know, they may not have like the backline depth that Austin do, but that doesn't mean they can't bring something to the table. However, one area that the team or the operation uh, behind Houston is significantly lacking in, and this was commented on, uh, I think, on the MLR fan zone, is uh, community outreach. And I mean, if you go onto the Houston Sabercats website at the moment, one of their latest articles was the kit reveal. You know, it was a fair few months ago at this point. Yes, they keep up to date on Instagram, I think, but I believe that's also the only social media account that they regularly use. And when you look at other teams that, well, even Austin, who are promoting everything they do with like a fresh press release. They're promoting everything with tweets, with Instagram posts, with Facebook posts. And it's allowing fans to stay up to date on what's going on. But Houston are just, it's been an issue since their inception. They're just dragging their heels. And, you know, maybe they need a new social media strategy. Maybe they need a new communications um, direction to go in. I think that's what's holding them back because if I, when I tell anyone that Houston is the only MLR team to have a rugby specific stadium in the entire league, people are like, oh, that's cool. They must be really engaging with rugby and with the fans. No, they're not. They're, <laughs> it's, it seems ridiculous that in a year where we've had to cancel the season, be more interactive and online than ever before, Houston are still making the same mistakes. Like they could have had, they could have been in a position where, you know, if everything was okay to open and, you know, they could have easily sold out the Aviva Stadium. And I don't see that happening now because they're just not telling the public, oh, we're here, come and support us. It's, it's confusing to say the least. And I think I think that's the operation that they need to focus on the most because, you know, at this point, we just want rugby. We just want games. We just want to be able to cheer our team on. And if you're in Houston, you could easily be unaware that there's an MLR team in your city just because there's so little interaction from them. But, right. that, but that's just me. 
right. I'm going to turn this back to the actual on pitch product that the Houston Sabercats have. Um, so there was a couple, obviously Danny kind of mentioned, like they did bring in a few, like, you know, solid names. Um, a little bit of kind of like an unfortunate thing though, that really did happen to their roster um, is that Kyle Brayton back and one of their new signings, Jeremy Leonard's um, from Seattle have both opted out of the 2021 season for, you know, personal reasons. And ultimately that's just, I mean, I don't know if a team benefited from Dallas dropping out of the season as much as Houston, mainly because that allowed them to pick up Cody O'Neill and, you know, in picking up Cody O'Neill, it's like they now have two locks because they picked up Cody O'Neill or two like full-time specialist locks. Um, right. They have Cody O'Neill and Apase Tuavaku, or, um, who was a lock who came over from uh, Zebra in the Pro 14. Um, so they have two really good locks, but then they just have you know, maybe Van Stewart behind them that can kind of play back row and lock. And like that, I think that's, you kind of look at their roster and stuff. And that is a big, big area of concern for me, especially like in a year where depth is going to be so important. Um, Like we're kind of talking about, you know, not just guys getting hurt or guys getting suspended, um, but like in general, like just like what who knows what's going to happen like covid wise and stuff too right like you know if you if you end up with oh yeah there there, i think we need to acknowledge the fact that there's going to be covid cases yeah i mean hey like uh the free jacks and old glory canceled a preseason game right like and uh you know that was that was part of part of the reasoning behind it right so you know we'll see we'll see how it goes so it's like depth is going to be massive this year and i think when we're talking about like austin's back line and the depth in their back line Right. Part of that is like, yeah, because you like you're going to need it. It's a long season. Right. And right now it's like, yeah, like like I honestly like looking at Houston's pack, which in all honesty is like if you took like the top eight, like the starting eight is actually pretty good. You can get like, you know, Lilo, Fertuni, Connolly, um, O'Neill, Tuavaka, Beauchamp, Magno. Um, Boyson, like it's a pretty decent pack. If you did that, maybe you have Solivera start at loose head instead. Um, you know what I mean? Like it's a pretty good pack, but like for the top eight, but it's like, what do you do if O'Neill gets hurt? Like, or suspended or otherwise can't play for any reason. Right. Like then you don't, you don't have locks like you don't. And it's, it's a big, it's a glaring hole, um, on their team. And it, it really is like, you know, Honestly, like it's just the one unfortunate thing where it's like I I do think I want like I want to look at like Houston and like I want them to succeed. They have the best kit in the league, um, or at the very least the best kit in the league that doesn't have a collar attached to it. Um, so third best in the league, really. Um, if they did put a collar on it, they would have the best kit in the league. They have like their own stadium and stuff. Like Stu said, like I really want to watch them succeed. It's like I just man, like I don't think they have the depth to do it this year at all i mean they did pick up like bronson tellis jin ho mun um from dallas too and i think they really needed i think they really needed that they needed to pick up those guys from dallas um it's just yeah like i mean they're they're starting 15 like i said i think it's good um you know obviously the back line ruse windsor windsor is probably like a perennial mvp candidate just because like the houston saber cats go through Sam Windsor. Like if Sam Windsor plays well, the Sabercats play well. If he's not playing well, Sabercats lost. Like that's really what Sam Windsor is, the heartbeat of that team. But even like Estale, mm-hmm. Freyer, Howden, like you said, Dickie Dicky Lai looked pretty good in the preseason game. Um, Pendulian, like, like they got a decent, like they got a pretty good like starting 15. It's just, I just don't, in my opinion, I don't think they have the depth to like especially in a year like where only the top two teams in a division are going to make the playoffs like i don't think they have the i i just don't see them having the depth to do that at all and i think one of the big like especially in their pack like i just don't think they have that or whatever and it's going to be a long season and stuff so 
that's kind of where I stand on the, the Houston Sabercats. And I guess like, I don't think, I think like they had definitely had moments in that exhibition game too against NOLA where they looked good. Um, but like, I just, man, like, I don't know. Like, it's just my, um, yeah, like, I just don't think like depth is going to be so important this year. And I really just looking at their roster, like I just don't necessarily see it for sure. But I think I also kind of see a little bit in like what Austin kind of had. And it's like, if you're a Sabres cat fan, it's like, maybe this year sucks, but you also have like the young talent. Like you said, all those pride guys, Liam Murray, um, Hildenbrand, right? Like a lot of, you know what I mean? Like guys like Bronson Tallis. And it's like, your time might be coming soon, but it's like you might have to kind of like suffer through deal with the tough year, times, deal with one, deal with a tough year, and then maybe kind of like maybe you make some key signings in the offseason. Maybe guys like Brighton back and Lanerts are available next year too. That helps. Um, but it's like, yeah, you might have to. This one might be I, honestly like this. This might be a tough year. <laughs> but. All right, let's move on to the new guys. Um, the new guys on the block play like guilty. Major League Rugby record of not applicable because they haven't played yet. Um, you can make the argument that key additions could be the entire team, but uh, we're you know uh, Sean McNulty uh, coming Everybody over from the, the Free Jacks. Yeah, Luke White coming from the Raptors. He's been a beast. Corey Thomas, Canadian, apparently. Um, Adam Ash uh, fr- from the Glasgow. Nick Boyer, who's kind of been on. You know, uh, the Raptors, uh, San Diego, I believe, as well. Uh, Christian Rodriguez, a young, exciting uh, up-and-comer. Luke Carty, which is was another surprise, and then turns out he's American, so that's great. Um, Adam, Adam Ashley Cooper, which we talked about last episode. Uh, Bill Meeks, uh, Mika Cruze from the Raptors, DTH, who we've had on the show. Uh, Canadian uh, Johnny Ryberg and Glenn Bryce and uh, Matt Gitzow, which was most recently announced. So... An did exciting you say, did you say dynamic Adam Cooper? I don't think you said Adam. Did you yeah, say I said him already? Oh, yeah. did you? Yeah, yeah, oh, I'm just I'm not paying attention to what you say. Wow, well, not listening at all. You're watching Poor the listening skills. Ah, uh, you know, yeah, so, I was gonna say I'm watching the so game. Canadians, just... they've so as for Canadians, we mentioned DTH. Um, Lindsay Stevens is a, can, a Canadian qualified uh player, uh, Corey Thomas, and uh, the nice little addition to their team, uh, Mark Carter, who will be an analyst with the team, but also rugby Canada. Six months, six months uh, with with both programs, which is fantastic for both parties. So my question, it's this question is similar to the um, to the Gil Gronies, but um, LA has had a kind of a robust uh, training camp almost a month. If you guys want to listen to more about that um, MLR kickoff, they interview uh, the head coach and he kind of talks about everything that they've gone through, uh, which is really really interesting. Um, but can this LA team come together and kind of a, and, and can this team come together in a barbarian sense? You know, you've got so many guys that are pros already, you know, or, or Raptors, you know, they've all got experience playing in a pro team. Can they just use that combined um, skill and just make something magic happen? Um, or will it take time? Like kind of other expansion teams that we've seen, you know, uh, it took pros quite a while to get to the team that they are and be the role in that, um, you know, it, it took, it took old glory some time to figure things out. So where do you guys seeing them starting their, their season? I just want to begin by saying that because of trade done during the MLR draft, uh, they have 12 international player spots on their team, as opposed to the 10 that other teams have. It also makes sense with Adam Akku and Matt having one season contracts and both have been on the verge of retirement prior to these contracts. So those two would make sense to be the um, one-year bonus players I have. I'm, I'm glad they're here. I think they'll definitely raise the profile of the league. And, you know, in the sense that... Um, I think LA will be the glitz and glamour Gill team and Austin will be the, the more relaxed of the uh, Gill branded teams. So I think having all like these star power names from the world of rugby, you know, 
guys that have played uh, multiple World Cups uh, on the team is going to attract a big audience, especially international audience. I know we've talked about it a lot, but I think getting more eyes on MLR is ultimately a good thing and having these international players will do that. Um, there's also a few players that whilst um, have played overseas, they are qualified to play for the USA as they haven't been capped by another union. And these will count as um, domestic players. That includes uh, Sean McNulty, Luke White, uh, Luke Carty, and uh, say Leasi. But this is like a big name team. It's like star power, as you expect with any anything in LA has to be, you know, up in like Blitz and glamour, you know, Hollywood, glamour. baby. Yeah. If they come out to the 20th century Fox opening title music, bum, bum. I think that will just bum, be perfect. That's how they should reveal their kits. Which we still haven't oh, seen yet. Which, yeah, yeah. We, we're still waiting. We're still waiting on this either black kit or pink kit or blue kit or yeah. You know, I think what they were. Together. I think what they were wearing at train that training scrimmage that there was pictures of. I feel like solely based on the fact that there was no numbers and it wasn't paladin. I don't think that's their kit. Yeah, yeah. The fact that the hipster logo they had here was definitely not. Covering the three, there's a lot of logos. Of a though. rival, there's a lot of was... logos. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, definitely a mix of logos, mix like a cocktail, and um, wow. But I think I never said the jokes were good. Um, or not. Mm -hmm. But in the same sense of if you, I think it will take at the very least one game for everything just to click into place. Um, so you could look at Toronto, you can look at Old Glory. They had strong performances when they started, but they didn't take the win in their first game. But then it would be like the following game, everything would just start to fall into place. Things start going their way, and that's when they get the victory coming through. Obviously, for the Arrows, it was a bit more difficult with the ARC going on in 2019. Um, and but Old Glory uh, lost their first game and then had a run of four games, all victories. The first of which was over the defending MLR champions. So for LA, it may be that their first game is you know a losing bonus point win, and by that I mean losing and getting the try bonus point. But it may take their second, maybe even their third game for everything to just gel in. And then I think uh, the league should definitely be concerned of what LA have in store. Yeah, I think that's probably fair. I think, you know, I think any team that's kind of assembled like this, and I mean, I know like they have a little bit of like Darren Coleman kind of recruited, you know, some of his guys. So it's like there's players that are familiar with at least what Coleman wants to do because they've played for him already. Um, but I think to me, like, I think any team that's kind of built like this, as you kind of said, a bunch of guys that have come in from all over, all over the world, really kind of converging on LA, you have absolute legends of the game, like, you know, get out and Ashley Cooper and DTH, you know, coming together with, you know, some guys that are just starting their professional careers. Um, and that's like, you know, a whole mix of a bunch of guys that are somewhere in between as well. Right. And ultimately, I think that it might take some time to gel together as with any new team should or would do. Um, but I think at the same time, too, there could be like an interesting thing that also kind of happens where it's like, I think L.A. is the most intriguing team in the league. Like, I think going into the season, I think you have all the stuff surrounding their team name and their branding and everything, which I mean realistically they should probably have merch or something out like it's two weeks until the season starts like they need to you should be able to you should be able to buy guiltini stuff by now now it's it's beyond late um but like the, all the stuff that's surrounding like the, the controversy with their team name and everything 
all like the absolute big name players, the elite superstar talent that they have. But I also think it's kind of a company with the fact that nobody's seen them play. Right. So it's like, it kind of comes out and it's like, you kind of look at it right now and it's like, you know, every other team in the league, you have film to look at and like, be like, this is what the Toronto arrows try to do this. The Seattle sea wolves try to do this. The Legion will do this. Right. You have all that on everybody else. And even like, you know, so far this year, it's like, yeah, like we got to see Nola. We've seen Atlanta. We've seen some Austin. We've seen some Houston. Um, We're probably going to see a little old glory later this week, too. And it's like you see game film on everybody. No one has seen L.A. yet, Right. And it's like, I wonder if that's a bit of an advantage for them, too, because no one knows. Like, you know, Armor kind of deal. Well, yeah, exactly. And like, little, yeah, exactly. And like, you know, kind of game plan for that and stuff. Um, The roster's deep. We mentioned the depth always. And it's just like. I'm I'm very curious to see like they look like they have a team especially in their backs when you have guys like Adam Ashley Cooper, Gitto, um Billy Meeks, um DTH Ryberg. It's like I think they're like it looks like you have constructed a pretty fast and skillful team. So I'm assuming they're going to kind of play a little bit of let's go with like a little Hollywood kind of style, right? Like super fast, entertaining. <laughs> Um, flashy kind of rugby. Man, if they the, can throw some of that Australian flair into it, I'm yeah, like so it down looks like it. it looks like that's kind of what they're going for, right? Um, and like I, I was honestly like before I sat, sat down, I was, I was I was like, I need to take a look at the skill teenies team, right? And I was like, when I sat down to look at it, I was like, okay, I know they traded for the the two extra foreign player slots. So you have twelve, so I'm assuming if you trade for those two slots, you're intending on using them. Right. And it was like my biggest question looking at the roster was like, okay, like what happens if like the American and Canadian guys start getting hurt or if they kind of go down or like, you know, they're or, you know, they can't play for whatever reason. Right. And it was just kind of like, do you have like, does that mean like if an American player gets hurt somewhere and it's like the next guy up happens to be Australian or from somewhere else? Does that mean it's like, okay, well, guys like Adam Ashley Cooper have to start coming out of the lineup because you need to fit in. I think that's yeah, that's what's going to happen is like you're going to have to it's going to be a check and balance kind of thing. Like, yeah, yeah, like if 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 if, you know, a prop, an American prop gets hurt, you're going to have to pull it out of Adam Ashley Cooper. Well, and and put an American center in, and put the, the you know the the import at prop. You know, like it's going to be something that they're going to deal with all, all season. But I think like I was looking at it, and it's like, like that was my initial that was like my initial thought, and I was like, man, like, but also kind of looking at their roster, and it's like I feel like the American and Canadian players might be spread out across the positions just like perfectly enough um that they could, you could probably get away with doing it like this i think it would be right. like like i mean it'll be interesting i think it'll be an interesting thing to see what the league like what happens with the guiltinis especially um because i think i think ultimately like it'll be interesting like if this strategy works like if that has like an impact or whatever of just loading up on like insane foreign talent um if that kind of has a little bit of an impact I think that'll be interesting, um, but I, I well, do, you know, I do, we've had we've had MLR like we've had yeah. people comment about uh, salary cap that they're kind of working yeah. with. We've had you know uh, people all over social media yeah. talk about. We even had Cole Keith and and who else? Uh, Sean White and Andrew Coe all kind of chirping in on about about the roster and about about salary cap. So it's. Yeah, yeah and that's like, that's salary, the one downside of being a. Yeah, I was gonna say salary info is not like a public thing, so it's like I feel like it's tough for me to directly comment on that and stuff, just because I'm like, like I don't know, but it's like, yeah, like Matt Gidow was famously one of the highest paid players in the world, like up until, right, like up until now, um, up until now, <laughs> like I, I guess up until now, like I don't, you know, and you know, like he he was making bank in Japan, right. And it's like, they do, they do have, and I think, I think I understand why fans might look at this roster and be like, how? Um, And it's like, you do kind of look at things like, yeah, they traded for foreign player slots, salary, like who knows? Um, But like, you know, until the league does something to punish them, I'll just operate under the assumption that it's, they're complying by it somehow, like until 
there's an this act- is also coming from a Saracens fan, so take that with a grain of salt. Yeah, so. exactly. And you know what, Sarah? Yeah, exactly. You know what the Saracens didn't do though? They didn't lose their championship, so they still got those stars above their logo too. So well, they lost in the championship. They did. They did. Yeah, but they still get to keep the they three that the they already got. So last All right. time, well, last let's, time let's... I checked, my Saracens kit still has three stars on it. Um, All right, that's fine. So uh, well, all right, whatever, cheater. Let's let's but, move but, on. Guys. Guess, so, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll just end that with the guillotines. I think my big like, yeah, exactly. It's like I think I do think their roster is spread out enough that you can probably balance the foreign player thing. It's kind of weird seeing an MLR roster that legitimately has more foreign players than American and Canadian players on it. Um, but it's like mm-hmm. I think they might be able to balance it out, but it's like Ultimately, it's like that might end up being a weird depth issue that they have to deal with. For right? Sure. It's just it'll be, like, it'll be you, very have two, you have two levels of depth. You have just the depth of your roster and then the depth of the actual domestic talent that you have to shuffle around. Um, so, I mean, we'll kind of see how they end up actually dealing with that. I'm just curious to see what, what game one's going to look like because, like I said, no one's seen them play. So we'll see how this goes. Yeah. And you know what? It might just be a one-year problem because a lot of guys seem to be only on one-year deals. So we'll see. All right. Well, we're going to stick in California. It's nice going alphabetically, but you can also kind of stay a little close geography, uh, geographically. Um, we're going to talk about San Diego quickly. Um, they have the best record in the West um, throughout their time in MLR. Um, 22-1-6. and six. Uh, Key additions, uh, Chris Bauman, which was a new, new signing. Very exciting. Uh, of course, Chris Robshaw. Uh, Michael Smith, Canadian, Travis Larson, Canadian, uh, Carlo Denition from uh, Colorado, uh, Cameron Clark, Bjorn Bassoon, uh, and Cecil Africa, the uh, uh, Blitzbox legend. Um, their Canadians are Josh Steele, who has been part of the club since uh, 2020, uh, Travis Larson, and, and Michael Smith. So, gentlemen, uh, I got a couple questions and I want to go through them quickly, but Will this venue change cause a bit of chaos for this team? I mean, you got guys like Chris Robshaw signing up to be in sunny LA and they're moving to sunny Las Vegas. Like it's, it's, and, and changing venues, changing, you know, um, training facilities, but even just like the climate, you're going from, from ocean, ocean side to arid desert. Um, and we're going to have to talk about this with the arrows next week, but will this venue change cause a bit of chaos for the team? On the pitch, logistically, give me your quick thoughts about it. I think the Legion are already in Vegas at the moment doing preseason training. That doesn't necessarily mean they're at um, the venue to do it. I believe I even saw like Chris Robshaw um, helping out at one of the like junior kids teams um, with practice drills and things like that. So I think they've already made the move um, to Nevada and are now getting used to... They're acclimatizing, I believe is the best word right. to use. So um, i say for the new players that you've uh, mentioned, probably not so much, seeing as uh, they've only, they would have only been in uh, San Diego maybe a few months before moving all the way to Vegas. Obviously, it's going to impact the fans the most because now that their team is in a different state and I obviously can't uh, speak on uh, states laws in uh, the United States at the moment but obviously California has been hit very hard with uh, COVID during this pandemic and you know obviously restrictions will be in certain Uh, locations and certain cities and certain districts and so on and so forth that may be that may be driving to Vegas to see games isn't on the table at the moment but maybe towards the end of the season to have a few uh, of their hometown crowd come out to Vegas and support them that could definitely be possible Um, as for the team themselves I think they're They've made peace with the decision. Um, they're just getting their heads down out there, already training in the arid climate. Uh, and, you know, it is going to be tough. I think it's going to be tougher on the other teams that go out to Vegas to visit them because obviously we had the Vegas VK, uh, 
Vegas weekender last year, but that was in February. And uh, February in Vegas compared with like May or June is going to be completely different. So I think that's definitely going to be a guarantee of having water breaks at every 20 minutes um, in Vegas. But I think, you know, being there now, things ready, getting uh, prepared for it. And also, as we mentioned, the uh, new uh, gambling partnership with MLR. If you're going to have a team in Vegas, you got to have betting in place. Yeah, honestly, I I don't think it matters at all. Like, I mean, as far as like from a competitive point of view, like it's, yeah, it is what it is. We all know why they're doing it. It's all COVID related and stuff. And I think it'll be the same for Toronto and stuff. It's like we the situation might be, might kind of suck, but at the end of the day, you got to go out and watch the uh, rugby uh, game. So let me I mean, put it, let me phrase it to you this way, playing, guys. All you are is playing on a different patch of grass. Like you got to figure. Yeah, it but out I think it's more than out. that. Like, let, let's just simply think about this. Like, like for the arrows, for example, they have to live in a hotel. Like, right. you don't have you don't get have the op, the ability to, you know, after a, a hard day of practice, go home to your family or go home to your your apartment that you're comfortable in. You have to go back to a hotel. You have to. You know, do the everything sanctioned by the team because you're not able to just yeah. hang out in your the neighborhood. Situation you know, like, is a little bit different, but yeah, because they can't. Well, they're starting. There's st- they. Yes. Right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so like, it's 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 going to be. I I think that you uh, we're, we're underselling it. I think that there it is going to have, have a huge impact. And I think a lot of that is just because of the fact that. They're not going to be in their normal and like pro athletes are, are crazy superstitious animals to begin with. Like to tell a guy, you're not going to have your normal routine to begin with is, is going to be crazy. Now. I mean, it might be different for other guys that are coming new into the league, but like if I'm Joe Pedersen and, and I'm, and they're telling me, okay, well we're moving you and you're not going to be familiar with the city at all. And Oh, also we're expecting you guys to be the best team again. Yeah, like, I I think that that's all going to have a huge effect on okay the let mindset. Me ask, let me ask you a question. With based on what you just said, do you think San Diego is still going to be one of the top teams in Major League Rugby? I don't think they're going to be as good as they were last year, but I think that they'll be in. Okay, do you yeah. okay, top two? Do you think they're going? They're a playoff team. Do you think they're in playoff contention? We'll talk about that later. Well, I mean, we got to talk about this now. It's in the context of this. That's what I'm saying. Like, uh, maybe. I think okay, I don't. You, let me put it to you, you this think, way. I, okay. Do you think San for Diego summer. is going to be a worse team because they have to play in Vegas? Yes. Okay. I do. Why? Just because, of, like, I, I guess because of the stuff you just said, really. But it, literally everything I just said. Yeah. Like, it, you, no. I think we are seriously underselling the recovery, the the ability to, to, feel comfortable in something that you've, you've been working on for the last couple of years. You know, they, they have been able to keep a good chunk of their roster and to then say, whoop, all right, we're moving to a different state. Um, probably not have your home fans around or so because you're in a different spot. Like it's, I think it's going to be a lot. I think it's going to be a lot for them to handle. And especially since resources might not be there, from a business side to, you know, have support in terms of, you know, flying family out or, or having kind of that mental health support. Again, I don't know what San Diego has in terms of the setup in terms of, you know, sports psychologists or stuff like that, but even just having to someone to talk to that isn't a coach that's going to say, suck it up. I think it's going to have a big effect and we'll see when, when, when they hit the pitch. Um, now, my second question about them is: Is there they have a kind of an interesting coaching situation? You know, co-head coaches. Um, I want to get your guys' thoughts about this because it's it's new and it's it's very interesting. How do you guys think this co-coach situation is going to go for the Legion? And this is hard again because we we don't know their coaching styles. There's a lot of different thing variables, but I want to get just a taste of what you think might how, how a situation like that would work 
So, I mean, obviously, we haven't really talked about that. Like, we're talking about the stadium and stuff. San Diego underwent a lot of big changes in during this offseason. They probably, I mean, there's a lot. Like, we haven't even we haven't even talked about like the players that are gone yet, um, and how to like kind of replace that. Like you said, you alluded to it at the top of the show. Where you're like, I would have called last. Where I think you said, Dan, like you would have called last year's San Diego team the best back line in the league or like one of them or the deepest or whatever your wording actually was. Um, but yeah, like part of that is like Rob Hoadley's gone. Um, so, you know, assistant coaches, you know, Scott Murray, Zach Test were appointed as co-head coaches. I don't necessarily think like, I, I'm, I'm interested to kind of see how it does play out, but like S- Zach Test and Scott Murray are both excellent coaches. Like that's part of the reason why San Diego has been one of the top teams in the league. And, you know, I think, I think Rob Hoadley is a little bit of a loss. They kind of lose him on the staff. I think that's kind of has more of a bit of an impact, but I think it's like between test and Murray, like you just kind of take what you're good at, do what you're good at, let the other guy do what he's good at. And ultimately I think you can kind of find like some cooperative cohesion there. And obviously like, you know, if you've been with the team already, like I like, you know, every team in the league has multiple coaches, right? It's just, you know, kind of one of those things where it's like you can give obviously like you know head coach is obviously an important distinguished title and stuff but i mean if san diego is going to spread the wealth a little bit then that's also fine i think i like yeah i i don't see why it can't work um i'm kind of with you though dan like i don't think san diego is going to be as good as they were last year but i don't necessarily think it's because they're playing in vegas i don't think it's because they have a pair of two co-head coaches i think it's just because they flat out their roster took a big depth hit um with especially in the back row right like i mean you kind of like we look at their backs last year and it's like you know devril ferris is gone luke burton's gone nanu's gone jp duplessis gone um mikey tao has gone like you know if you even go through it like paul mullen's gone josh ferno has gone Like that's a big, a big chunk of their core of what they made that team, of what made the San Diego Legion super scary and what made it look like, you know, they were undefeated. They looked like they would probably stay undefeated for quite some time, at least until they played Toronto. Um, But, you know, they would kind of keep going through that. And I think losing a lot of those guys. And I mean, like, I know like they've like new guys have come in um, obviously like, you know, Cecil Africa, um, like it's like and uh, Basson, um, but it's like Gonzalez and Glacius as well. And I think there's like there there is the talent that's there, but it's like you know I think especially you look at like centers, like the center position, right? And it was like Dylan Odsley and Ryan Matthias used to be like your like your you know your I guess your second choice center in a way, right? Because that was Nanu and JP Duplessis. And if you have Ryan Matthias and Dylan Odsley as your second choice centers, that is like terrifying for a lot of MLR teams. And now like mm. they are their first choice centers, which isn't bad. And now you have like J um, feel and Clark behind them, which isn't, which isn't bad, but it's like, it's definitely not the same as like that depth is not the same. Um, so it's like, I don't, I think they'll still be good. I like, I think they'll still be good. I think they'll still be in a playoff race in that contention and stuff there. But I, I think they did take a little bit of a hit. Um, it's really nice pickup from Chris Bauman though. Um, earlier this week is obviously Paul Mullen's gone. Um, so they did they signed um Hankus Van Zwijk um earlier in the year, and then he opted to not come to MLR at all. So they were down, um, you know, a tight head prop again. So good on good on them to you know find someone make and you know a twenty five capped eagle at that too. So you know that's a big pickup that definitely helps them. Yeah. I by I by no means think the San Diego Legion are a bad team. I just I don't think like you know with their offense and stuff, the way they play, I do like it. I think Zach Test is going to continue to like coach in that style where they are going to play a little creative, a little um you know have that offense. Um you know what I mean like Safe Toto Vosau is still your winger, which means you are scoring a lot of tries. Um like it's going to happen, you get him the ball, he will score tries for you. Um But, and, you know, like Peterson's still there. That's some valid leadership. Augsburger. Um, Denition is a nice replacement from 
uh, for Devereaux Ferris. So thank you again to the Dallas Jackals for that one. <laughs> um, but the Dallas Jackals, man, providing the Western Conference with depth pickups here. Um, but yeah, like I don't, I don't know. Like, how do you guys feel about the way the rosters, the roster for the, the Legion's kind of constructed going into this year? Just because, I mean, like for for me, it's just, and I like like their backs are good. Like their forward pack is good. Like it's strong. Like Nasa KK, um, like Wu Ching Veramula, um, you know Travis Larson in there. You know, yeah, they got to shout out the Canadian. What, what it come Michael down? Smith got to shout out the more Canadians and stuff too. Like their back, especially their back row. Their back row is fun, man. Rob Shaw, Smith, Vermula, Wu Ching, Larson, Tamalu. Um, like, dude, like that back, that back row is fun. Like that stack too. Be interesting to see what Rob Shaw does. But I'm just like, I just can't. I don't know. I just, I, I guess ultimately, like, I kind of feel like they just took a little bit of a hit. I don't necessarily think it'll be they'll be bad, but I don't think we're gonna see. I think the 2020 San Diego Legion, that terrifying force might be yeah absent what it what it comes down to for me is you know do i think that they're any worse than la or or uh the gil gronies yeah. no i think that they're all pretty even but what i think i think that maybe la and austin might even have a deeper lineup in terms of just like scoring power and and experience think- but what I but what I think keeps San Diego in that conversation yeah. of those top three teams is is their experience. You know, they're, start, they're starting. They've already had it. Um, yeah, they're, like they're, it's still a very yeah. very strong team, but they also have all this MLR experience. Yeah, you know, it's just, just and I mean, even like you you know you look at someone like that. I guess the direct replacements and stuff like Luke Burton leaves, so you bring in um, Gonzalez Iglesias. As well, like that, that's a big pickup. You know, he's he's got 41 arch caps for the Pumas, you know, so like that's a big pickup too. You still have Joe Peterson, who is like, you know, one of the best players in the league, right? You know, steady, can't, you know what I mean? Steady, steady she goes. excellent, excellent at controlling the game. His game management is phenomenal. Um, so he's still there. You can use him at 10 or you can use him at 15. You have um, Africa, who is obviously one of the best sevens players ever. Um, so that that'll be interesting, um, seeing him this year too. And like you said, he brought in, uh, Basson who's, um, I think he's got, how many caps does he have? 11, he's got 11 Springbok caps, right? So like, you know, it's like, there's still the, the talent is there. The talent might be different. I might honestly, like I look at it and I'm kind of like, I wonder if they got better. I don't know if they got better. I don't know if they got worse. I think they might, maybe they're even, maybe they just replaced guys and stuff but it's like they're still good they're still a scary team but it's like i mean maybe i'm just sad that Mananu only got to play four games in major league rugby but that would have been cool but i still think they're going to be a, a solid team though without a doubt all right let's let's keep her moving um we're gonna we're gonna go to the pacific northwest and we're gonna talk about seattle uh the the, the really the first kind of team that really uh, you know, Sean, uh, the light that was Rugby Canada and MLR. Um, some additions, um, no real big game change. Um, you know, JP Aguirre from from Rooney could be a really really good cool acquisition, but I mean they've got center depth for days. Um, Rhino Herbst, uh, Devro Ferris, we kind of mentioned, and then their two draft uh, um, draft picks, Aaron Matthews and the Canadian. Nick Taylor or Canadian eligible Nick Taylor. Um, they still have the Canadian. largest engine. not Canadian eligible. He's he's Canadian. Like just flat out. Listen, I when when he was first announced, there were there were, it was it was a flurry of discussion. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Hey, he played um, the Calgary Canucks, but so I'll give him with, the full Canadian. Okay. Okay. Um with with Taylor being added, they they hold their title still with the most Canadians with uh, George Barton, uh, Justice Sears Duro, Jake Elnicki, Nikai Penny, Brock Stoller, and Taylor. Now, gentlemen, they had a rough season last year, um, not up to their standards of being the two-time MLR Shield. Was last season's start a sign of things to come, or were injuries to blame for their losses? Because, you know, in that uh, Tasman Sharks game, they were beaten up 
<laughs> Seema, Neil, you know, they had, they had a lot of uh, in- injury problems to start the season. So do we blame it on that? Or are we looking towards a rougher, rougher waters with the Seawolves this year? I um, think, I think the, it's a little of column A and a little of column B. Obviously no one wants to have uh be taken off due to injury and unable to play in the games that you know make up the season, especially if it's a preseason game that's you know just for bragging rights more than anything else against a admittedly weakened team from the Mitre 10 Cup because they didn't have all their starting 15. Still the Mitre 10 Cup. Yeah. yeah, but still. And the point being that what makes a good team, and we've talked about it already, is when it comes to things like Austin and LA, and it's not just having the best starting 15, it's also having the best bench and then the best reserves as well. And I believe that Seattle were woefully exposed in the opening well, the only five games from 2020 of the MLR season. They only had the one victory against um, the Free Jacks. And then the even the final game, which they should really, any other year, would have put away on the 80-minute mark. Utah were able to get the victory in the end. And, you know, I think when it comes to... Seattle, especially in 2019, because I think that's a fairer year to gauge them on, is that they were iffy at the start, obviously not as bad as 2020, but they were consistently good when they needed to be. So if you look towards like the back end of the season, they were doing much better than at the start. And that obviously paid dividends come the uh, playoffs and the final. So it, I, I would say you would be a fool to ever count Seattle out, but I, I see them being better than 2020, but not as good as 2019. Uh, so somewhere between finishing 10th and winning the championship. Well, this is a narrow down prediction there. Well, this is the thing is that Seattle in both seasons that they've won the Shield, they didn't finish the season they've as never finished the best for, team. Nope. And that's, that's what I like. That's about. the crux on them. I in that I like an underdog. No, that, <laughs> hey man, you it doesn't I like, I like championship team Saracens. See, yeah, always <laughs> back in the underdogs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Crusaders, he's, all blacks, he's a, he's a, yeah. all blacks. Mostly, yeah. Gotta no. cheer for the little guy. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, yeah. So make fun of from all the the Toronto Arrows fans because they're we all know how not at the top of the table they are. Um, that was only one season. Come on, yeah. only four games. And hey, they made the playoffs in their first year. What are you talking about? Yeah, and then lost. Yeah, doesn't count. Longest, longest, win, longest uh, winning streak in MLR. So there's something there. good team, <laughs> um, but okay. So I think, yeah. So I think Seattle will be to me. I think they're going to be a lot closer to the championship team than the tenth place team um, this year. You guys, you kind of mentioned Dan. It's like not a whole lot of new additions to really go off of, but also not a whole lot of like departures on their roster either. Um, Jeff Hassler, obviously a big one. Um, Jeremy Lennertz, who we mentioned went to Houston, but, uh, you know, unfortunately for Houston, not going to play this season anyways. Um, so that's unfortunate. Um, and then Vili Tolatau, um, fan favorite, um, the original MLR finals MVP and stuff. Um, so he, he's going to, um, like he's off to, um, uh, Rejects. New England, New England. That's what I'm trying. I'm trying to say the words New England. Tough, tough. English is hard. Um, but like, so they're off to there. But I think like their team set up well. I think to kind of like deal or like I guess deal with those departures with some of the guys that they did bring in, right? So like, 
I mean, for Hassler, not really a whole lot of new wingers, but like you can shift David Busby over to the wing. Um, as Dan, you already mentioned, they have like just a wealth of centers. Um, their centers are like their centers without Busby are nuts. Um, like like you said, Egg um, Aguera, Barton, uh, Joey Iosefa, Kieran Joyce, Ross Neal, and Sonny Ula is back too. So it's like that's you know that's unreal. So you can shift some of those guys around to make Hassler's departure work. Um, so Busby likely goes to the wing with Staller um, and the twins too. So, um, and then you also have, I think like Leonard's is gone. So you bring in Rhino Herps. Um, that's, you know, obviously, you know, he played for the, the lions in super rugby. Um, so that's a big time replacement for him. Um, and, you know, you also bring in, you know, Namibian capped over North North J um, in order to replace, like assuming Tolatau was playing hooker during that game, they bring him in to replace. Um, I know he did kind of split some time between a couple different positions there. Um, I think though the big one too, like from last year, I think what you kind of saw with Seattle at the start of their season was the key, like Ben Sima got hurt in that game against the Tasman Mako. And I think what you kind of saw was it was like maybe that was a bit of an issue for them with the like fly half depth as like what happens after when Sema goes down. Because when Sema's in, um, he was literally perfect. Didn't miss a didn't miss a kick all year. Um, 13 from 13 over that short season that he didn't play every game in. Um, but I think when you had like Scott Dean, I think we really kind of saw with the game against the arrows, where it was like, you know, Taylor or uh, Taylor Adams, Sam Malcolm were able to just pick apart the Seawolves with kicks and stuff. And Dean wasn't really able to kind of match that. But I think Seema is a guy that I think could match that and could help. And I think you also kind of bring in, too, you use one of your smartly, use one of your draft picks to pick a fly half, too, in Aaron Matthews, um, who is also a little bit of a utility thing. But I think you kind of add to that depth. Hopefully, um, you know, he's on the road to recovery after his injury at the world 10 series but if he comes in right it's like that could be a little bit of a bonus but i think if you yeah for honestly, sure honestly i think if you have a healthy ben Sima or whatever this team already is different and i mean you like he the Sima looked good from uh in that world 10 series too and i mean if you have a guy like Sima who has that accuracy and as the world 10 series shows he got the, he's got range on him too so i think you know, I think you bring that in. Was that what, 12 them. pointers or 10 pointers? They were, you got five points, five points, five points for the, the 50 yard conversion kick or the 50 meter conversion kick, something like that. I got to refresh my world 10 something series like memories, but I think you even still have that. Like there were some positives from the team last year too. They still had one of the best scrums in the league and almost all their guys from the, that make that the best scrum in the league are back. I think they were, they were like fourth ranked scrum in the league and all right. the guys are coming back. Right. Um, so that's still there. Um, you know, like Sears Duru's back. Um, you know, so just like you said, Sears Duru's back, Il Nikki's back, um, right, Metcher's back. Um, there's so like that's already good. You, like I said, their locks are nuts. You got, you know, Brad Tucker, Herps, Taylor Crumray's in there too, outside backs with like Nakai Penny, who I mean like hope like we gotta hopefully like he's got to use this season to be like this is give me a canada jersey like this has to be like nakai penny's like you're writing this is your like your cover letter and your resume to rugby canada this season <laughs> to be like give me a jersey um so right. like I, I i think like honestly like front the back they're still good they're healthy Deverell ferris nice little addition reichert hatting he led the league in try scoring last year right so it was like it wasn't it was they had a weird season the right in 2020. I think if we saw it play out the whole time, I f I'm confident. I feel like they could have turned that around. Um, unfortunately, it's something that we, it's remains a question mark as so many other things. Yeah. We'll never know. Do. We'll never know. Um, but I think, I think they're going to come back pretty strong this year. Um, uh, so with Stu's comparison of 10th versus shield, I'm going, they're going to be a little bit closer to the shield. The, uh, the biggest question yep. is, though, is only two teams make the playoffs. And so we'll see how the she, she goes. For sure. I uh, You've talked me off the ledge, uh, Derek. So good job. I uh, I had the much 
much lower, but you you talk me back into it. Well, like, like, all right, guys, let's 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 do the last team uh, and finish finish this off. Uh, the Utah Warriors. They're an interesting interesting team. Uh, they had a, you know, they were a playoff team in the first season, and then it's kind of progressively gotten worse. Um, their record is seven wins, three ties, which is crazy, and 19 <laughs> losses. Is anybody else even remotely close to three ties? Like, does anybody else have two? Uh, not, I know you not in the not in the not in the Western Conference. Maybe uh, Glendale. Glendale might have hmm. might have two. I don't know. Um, but they've they brought in some some interesting uh, uh, positional players. All all of Khalifi, uh, after taking a year off, is back in MLR. Paul Mullen, uh, I guess, got off that island uh, off of Ireland, and he is playing in MLR, which is fantastic. Uh, Fraser Hurst, Canadian, uh, has joined the team. Uh, Cliven Loopster from uh, Namibia, I believe. Yep, Namibia, Namibia. Okay. Um, uh, Rodney Iona and of the big one is uh, Mikey Teo is is joining the team from from uh, San Diego, so uh, that it's a big 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 grab for Utah. My key question, and this is actually something the Stu brought up, and so I appreciate this Stu, appreciate you. Thank you. After another last minute loss, which has been a huge problem for them. Um, their last couple seasons. Uh, I know. Granted, this one was a preseason loss. You know, mm. they lost to to rugby ATL. Is this problem a fitness issue for the team? Like, like in terms of depth, like, do they just not have the depth that other MLR teams are are putting out there, or is this just something that's just a mental brain thing that, like, the the Toronto Maple Leafs seem to have this problem? They get up four one and then. Whoop! Here comes the Ottawa Senators, the worst team in the league. You know, like, is this something that they can fix by just training and practicing, or is this a personnel problem? I don't think it. I don't really think it's an issue um, as much as you guys are making it out to seem. Um, I think, like, I mean, if you really look at the, the the game against Atlanta, like. Their biggest issue, I don't think, had anything to do with like fitness or like mental or anything. It was they had a lot of opportunities within, like, especially in the first half when they had the win. And it was like they had a lot of opportunities when they were like, you know, close to the try line or with a line out at five meters. And they just didn't capitalize on a, on a few of them. And if they did, then they probably win that game. Um, but I think like you look at that game and like the one big positive is like, I like they had all their points came off of scrum penalties, right? They had the penalty try was a, uh, off of a scrum. And then both of Gianna Scully's uh, penalties were as the result of a scrum penalty and some prime position too, um, which obviously, you know, Paul Mullen was outstanding in that game. So I think you're looking at that as that's a big positive for your team. Um but you do probably have to figure out other ways to also score. And I think like what you're kind of saying, it's like a fitness issue or like a mental thing. And it's like, Dan, like the game you were literally just playing behind you. I think it changed now. I'm not sure from the start of the podcast. Yeah, no, now I'm watching uh, Seattle versus NOLA from 2019. All right, well, there you go. All right, so I know what the game ended. But the game that you did, like their last game to end the last season was epic where there's like they were losing at the 80th minute and then grinded down the famous seawall defense for eight minutes. i know but i just think I of the the, the 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 epic loss or uh, was it the, the loss or tie that they had against the What's then it? glendale raptors hmm. where like they were up by like double digit points and They've, Glendale came back and pulled, and they've had they had a couple of games like that in the 2019 they've also, season. I mean, they've also been on they've also been on the receiving end of the two most of the two biggest score totals put up by any team. Um, but it's like I just I don't think I don't think it's so much it's an issue. And in all honesty, like kind of like looking at their squad, I think Brandon Sparks did well at the draft. I think you kind of like it's one of those teams that I think they're kind of like looking at being like we're, you, like you can tell like there's a clear like we're building for like the future and stuff on this right and i think having guys like you know sean Pittman, sean davies to kind of like aim the ship and steer that ship is going to be very good for them um i think 
you know, you look at the, their draft. They picked up Elijah Hayes, Danny G and Scully, who was already, like I said, he was the fly half in the preseason game and he looked good. Derek Ellingson, John Powers. It's like a it, good draft. Um, you know, in, some interesting pickups too, like um, Logan Tago, former, um, well, he was signed to the Montreal Alouettes anyways. I think like, you know, 2020 wiped out the CFL season too. So that's kind of an interesting pick. I know crossover athletes have been a big theme this year. Um, so that's interesting. Obviously, Mikey Teo, um, you know, Paul Mullins, a huge one. Um, you got Aston Fortunin from the, uh, you know, the the Southern Kings. I think like, like, I, like it's a decent team, like across the board. And obviously you still have a lot, they, like they re-signed a lot of guys too. Right, like a lot of their core is back. Guys like Franco, um, Franco Vandenberg's back, Jensen's back, Lance Williams is back and healthy, and quite frankly, looked very good in that preseason game. Bailey Wilson's back too. Um, Uhila, Van Buren, Baska, Hagen, Schultz. Um, like they're like their their tens are good. Like their tens, you have Schultz. Um, Schulte, uh, who's German capped, Laubser, who's Namibian capped, and then one of their draft picks, Gianna Scoli, who score, had six points, looked fairly, uh, and a couple of really nice clearance kicks. I mean, the wind probably helped a little bit on uh, some of the distance on those clearance kicks, but they were well placed. Um, like, so I think that's good to like, those, those are all good, um, things that they've, they've been doing. I think they're building it. I think the ultimate question is, is like, for them, is it's like, I think, I think they're better than houston and it's just to me it's a question of like do you think they can compete with for a playoff spot and i'm not sure they're quite there yet especially given the fact that the playoffs are just the top two teams in the in the division this year right so it's like are you one of are you better than two of austin la seattle and san diego right like and i I don't think they're quite at that point yet but i think they're building towards something um, one thing though, too, I really, I really find fascinating with their roster is the fact that they, they only have two scrum halves, um, in Michael Baska and Frazier Hurst. And I think for Frazier Hurst, especially like the, what that's an unreal opportunity that I don't think he would necessarily get on a, other MLR teams. Um, because man, like coming out of like UBC, like he's, he's playing every game, like he could, because he has to play every game. Like unless you like mm-hmm. decide to start converting guys, so I think from like that Canadian kind of point of view, like I mean, I look back at um like the Saber Cats and stuff, and it's like you got guys like uh like Rue since uh there right, and it's you know how much like this Crosby Stewart's gonna have to battle for that playing time, um whereas Fraser Hurst is like you you got it man like here's here's the keys like go run with it. Um, so like it, it'll be, um, I think that'll be great for him. I can't wait to kind of see what he does, um, uh, this season. And like, you know, I, I, I did, I did like what, uh, what I kind of saw from him in, um, the preseason game. So, um, you know, best of luck to him, man. I hope like, cause he, he's in a great situation to just kind of develop himself because, you know, he, he's on a team where it's like, he's, he has to be the guy, which, you know, could, could be a really good thing for him, especially also too, like Sean Davies is there as your coach too. So that's going to be a big help for a scrum half development as well. I'm going to actually go the other way. And I'm going to say that there's been a, I don't know if it's like been a cloud or there's been like a voodoo curse or a hex over Utah, but Going back through all the games they've played, the only time they've scored consecutive victories was in the 2019 preseason against Life West and then the following game against the New England Free Jacks. Yeah, even, uh, Every- even in the year before when they made the playoffs, they didn't, they didn't string together two wins? Nope. Oh, wow. They have... Even in 2018, where they had a few exhibition games, they uh, beat Austin, they beat Houston twice in 2018, but they they did get losing bonus points, and I think that's what was able to get them into the playoffs. Mm -hmm. But then they lost to Glendale in the uh, semifinals. In 2019, uh, the only team they beat was... Austin, the only team that lost every game, they 
drew against mm. Glendale. They then lost the subsequent fixture by that huge margin we talked about. And interestingly, they drew against Seattle in uh, their penultimate game of the 2019 season, which, they, they you know, did, for a lot... And that was Seattle in Seattle. Was time, eh? And that was in Seattle yeah, as well. They, uh... Not many teams can say they have a win or a, at least a draw against yeah. Seattle away. So, you know, credit where it's due. But then I'm going through it. There's a number of games where... Uh, so Nola Gold, they lost 19 to 21. Uh, Houston, they lost 27 to 29. Even Toronto in um, their fixture in May, they lost within a losing bonus, within seven points. These are games that, you know, could have been easily Utah's to win, but, you know, something just wasn't there in the end to give them the points advantage. Mm -hmm. And the team that they beat in 20 the only team they beat did beat in 2019 was the team they tied with in um 2020 which was austin but then they got a victory against new england and then of course that big victory against seattle to end the season with but and and this has been an issue i think when it comes to things like momentum is that utah have not been in the position where they've won a game and then won the next game and they've never been able to build that momentum which has then pushed them from being the, the bottom one of the bottom teams for 2019 obviously um it was different in 2020 but we can say that because of the pandemic we can't really tell what would have happened it i think austin if austin not austin sorry if utah can get back to back wins then i'll be more open to seeing like how far they can go but it just seems to be at the moment that they although they have been successful as you said they did make the 2018 playoffs they are up against tougher opposition in their own conference obviously we're going to talk about uh, the eastern conference next week and it's going to be a case where maybe it's utah become one of the bottom teams obviously we're saying this in the preseason when I'm only going on the results that they've already done. Sure. I'm sure, sure. I'm sure Mikey tail will score like a three gazillion tries. tries. Yeah. Oh. And will be the reason and will be the herald of uh, Utah allowing them to get, you know, seven games For on sure. the bounce. All right, guys. Well, I think you guys have hit some really good points about Utah. I think it's hard to look back at, you know, past seasons but that's all we really can do i mean so much change for all these teams but you know I will we'll, say, we'll see we'll see what happens i will say i did hear on the broadcast of the preseason game which also by the way that was super cool well done like full out legit preseason game broadcast that was awesome um but i heard that they're like their pre-game like hype dude um did the, like the Warriors come out to play chant before the game? And I don't know if I've ever did. I've just never heard that before in their thing. But honestly, the fact that they do that, that gives them like, that's just bonus points for me. So I will forever like the Utah Warriors <laughs> as long as they keep there you go. Thing, a movie from 1979. I'm still waiting for Houston to do a parody of Thundercats when uh, they take thunder, to the field. Thunder, thunder, That's what we should do. One episode, man. Let's just assign everybody like an <laughs> 80s, 80s cultural reference. All right. And I'm going to... Uh, yeah. Right, we'll Remember we'll that. Remember that. Halfway through the season, we'll do it. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, we're going to do everything that every podcast does, and we're going to kind of give out some preseason awards for the Western Conference. And we'll do this with the East as well. Kind of, we're going to got to talk about some guys we're excited to see. Um, and we're going to start with our best newcomer. And I don't say best rookie because we're going to go with someone who's never played in MLR. So, uh, you know, eligibility does not stop at being, you know, a young, a young guy. Um, get so up, I'm gonna get, your old rookie of the year. Yay. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually going to start with, um, uh, with my uh, best newcomer who I think is going to have a big impact. Uh, Bill Meeks from the Guiltinis. Mm. Um, I'm a London Irish fan. Um, they're fly half excluded. 
Um, and I got to watch a lot of him, you know, in the past couple months during the pandemic when he made the switch over. Then he's such he's such a dynamic player. And I think the difference between um, uh, Adam Ashley Cooper and uh, Gitau and Meeks is I think Meeks still has a lot in the tank where he probably could have found a contract in some of the top tier teams in Europe. Um, maybe might not just had the best fit for him on any of the teams and maybe the offer with the guild teams was just too good. But I think that he is going to have a good season and he's my newcomer of the year. I'm going to say that I'm going to stick with LA because they're, they're the newcomer team. So they have to have all the newcomers. Everybody on LA. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Darren Cole. Um, no, I. <laughs> hey, I mean, count. Um, I think, that's, I, I think fair, that's a fair thing to say. Why can't, like, maybe, man, like, why can't he be? Co- coaches deserve yeah. He's not going to step onto the pitch. You don't know that. During the game. During the game. Um, I'm. I'm going to go with the big name signing um, that is uh, Matt Gissau. I think that him as I only chose him as above Adam Ashley Cooper because I think we all had like an inkling that uh, Gissau was going to sign with LA and we were just like, oh, come on now, where you know, season's about to start. You need to let us know as soon as possible. And now that it's obviously happened, is great um and you know it's he in his uh press release was mentioning that he was kind of like disheartened with how the top league finished in japan and you know he w- obviously wanted to have a full season to be able to call time on his career so i think he has one this is his, this is his one last opportunity to prove that you know he can still he can still uh, play kick it with, with the kids. Boys. Yeah, kick it with uh, fellow youngsters on the team, <laughs> um, and then he could. And I think whether LA lift the shield or make the playoffs, or even if they finish third, is that he can say, "I did what I came to do. I played my best, and now I'm willing to like walk off into the sunset." with uh, awesome 80s rock montage music playing behind me. Um, <laughs> and and I, so I think that because he knows that the, it's his last song and dance at the uh, game, he wants to put in like the best effort he can possible. So that's why he's my pick. Um, me and Dan were actually very similarly on, the, on a very similar page there. Um, I was definitely thinking Billy Meeks would, uh, would be up there, but you know, um, I, just because why, why talk about the same guy? Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So what I would say, what I'm curious in, what I'm really curious in, and I'm not so much certain that he'd be like, if you were to give out like an, an actual award, but my picks, I'm going to go with two. I'm going to pick two guys here. And I talked about the, oh, God. Talk about Austin. it's going to be two. I'm going with Cam Dodson and Connor Mooneyham um, because I, guys, like this is, you know, everyone was kind of thought like around the draft and stuff too. It was like a lot of people that I've, I've talked to have been like Mooneyham is ML already. Um, like right out the gate, he can make an impact on Austin. And I'm just like, I just want to like, let's see it. Like, I can't, like, I want to see what the, it's like I think we've talked about this before. It's like this is the draft class that every other draft class gets to measure up to or whatever. I want to kind mm-hmm. of I'm I'm very curious. I want to see what happens with what happens with it. Um, so I mean, obviously, you know, from life university, bit of a utility back, usually center wing. They played him at full back against Nola. So um, and you know, he looked solid in in his uh in his appearance this weekend. So I'm excited. I'm excited to see see what he does. I'm also excited to see what Dodson does. Um, number eight, too, should be a good pack. In um, like I think, and there's a whole bunch of guys. Like I'm, I'm taking a newcomer. You guys are naming 38 year old Matt Gidow and 29 year old Billy Meeks here. So I'm going to go with uh, the the actual 
young lads. I'm going to treat this as a bit of a rookie of the year award and uh, we'll see what. Uh, you know, it's funny. It's Derek wanted clarification on it and still went with the young guys. So it. I appreciate the gusto. Yeah, it's okay, like- guys. Next, next award is going to be the best Canadian. We are a Canadian centric podcast after all. So I want you to put your, your thinking caps on and go with who you think is going to be the best Canadian from the Western conference. Um, I'm going to go again first. Cause you know, I wrote the script. So ha ha ha. Um, Nakai Penny. God he was it. on, <laughs> <laughs> he was on an absolute rip to end the season. Uh, and he did uh, Derek already kind of mentioned it earlier when we we're talking about Seattle, he's got to put his hand up for, for Canada's selection. You know how, what, what else does the guy got to do? And what I say, what he's got to do is got to be the best Canadian. I think he's going to do it. You know what? I'm not even changing. You know, I'll change my answer for the other one. I'm not even changing it for this one. It's not Kai Penny. I think like I mentioned it. And at the beginning, I think, you know, he's, he's going to start. Um, in that sevens jersey and I think like especially too like you got some a lot of other um, you know blinds or sorry you got a lot of other open side flankers in the league that are Canadian right even that like you know like Michael Smith now in San Diego obviously Rumble and Heaton out in the uh, out in the east and yeah I think this is honestly like and if he if he doesn't play out that he like I mean I, we watch this whole season and it doesn't play out that it ends up being the Kai Penny or whatever that's fine but it's like I I think because there's a lot of great Canadians in the in this conference obviously you know you still got Hassler Regan or Gorman really good too um obviously DTH Vandermerver he's pretty good last time I checked so I mean I don't see why he wouldn't be in the running for this um and even like some teammates there too, like uh, uh, Sears Duru. And, uh, but like to me, it's like this is the year for like Nakai Penny to be like, like force it. Like, don't even be like, it's not even a question of whether or not like you should have a jersey or whatever. It's like force, force it upon Kingsley Jones to be like, hey man, like you can't ignore this anymore. I'm so, I think it's Penny's year. I think he, he looked outstanding in the five games last year. Um, I think it's it's his time to do it. I hope I hope he lives up to it. Um, I yeah. All right. I I can't. Even, I'm not even going to pretend to not agree with Dan on this one because that was my pick right all, right away. Nakai Penny. Interesting choice. Um, oh, who's like he was my oh, sec- I, I also two out of three disagree with you, Stu. So now I'm curious <laughs> as to where you're going to go with this. Okay. So I I was on the verge of picking Nakai Penny as well, and then I'm like. I'm pretty sure either Dan or Derek would have uh, picked them as well. So, Dude, why? you know, because that's that not a, great answer. a bit of spice, a bit of flavor. Yeah. So what's so saying is that it, it, I, the Kai Penny, it's also his answer, but whatever. Well, actually, I so my decision has gone to a prop also with the Seawolves because, you know, seeing him at the World Cup, I've seen him uh, play in MLR. And some things aren't just measured by how many tries you scored or how many tries you've assisted in. It's the consistency of being in the front row, obviously being in all like the set pieces, scrum, the most obvious, but then again, also in uh, the lineouts as well. And, you know, and that's what I, that's what I look for in the best players are always consistent. They're always consistently good. They're always doing their job for their team. And that's why my pick, while I do agree that Nakai Penny is amazing and will do great work this season, I think it's impossible to ignore the consistently great work of Justice Sizdaru. I didn't ignore it. I literally said his name during my speech. Oh, I like it. I like it. All right, right, guys, and let's finish off with uh, your MVPs. Like, uh, like Dan, I know you kind of mentioned it. Corey Thomas, I feel like, is the dark horse. That might, uh, yeah, a complete unknown wild yeah. card. And yeah. and and we're going to, you know, the arrows have pulled in a couple of wild cards as well. So it, it's going to be interesting. Uh, okay. Uh, the uh, Western uh, Conference, though. No, no. And we're going to talk about them next time. Exactly. Um, talk, just talking about Canadians. God. All right. Derek, who's your MVP for the oh, Western Conference? This is kind of going to give, 
I think I know because uh, I know you want to do a little bit of a standings thing next. So this might kind of give it away, but I'm going to say my MVP is going to be Ben Sima. Okay. All right. Um, Stu? I'm going to go with a man who was meant to be with Dallas and is now with LA. I'm going to go with one of my uh, favorites to not play for the Arrows is uh, Ryan James. You're a big. Uh, I'm going with Ross Neal all the time. Uh, I'm going to go twice in two months. And so, twice two... wow, that's a lot. That's a lot of Ryan James, man. Why, why are you picking Ryan James over? You got to, uh, I'm just asking for elaboration. Uh, as the M- MVP of the entire Western, oh, the same by Ryan James. Yeah. Well, like I said, I'm looking for a guy who is consistent. And every time I've seen Ryan James play when he played for the Raptors, he was a consistently good player. He was always doing the job that was required. He was always helping his team. And, you know, obviously you can't win, can put in the best effort that you can. Ryan James, I'm well. I'm glad that he's still just excited to see what he can bring to the table. So that's why I'm picking Ryan James. All right. Uh, I'm going with Ross Neal from Seattle. Um, we were kind of robbed of his talents uh, last year in MLR because of injury, uh, and then he went and had a uh, great loan over with the Irish. Again, I'm I'm very consistent with my Irish love. Um, he was very consistent with them and, you know, he's got other premiership experience with the wasps. And then, you know, he went to the, the world 10 series and, and was fantastic for the Royals there. He's just a giant beast of a dude can play center, can play wing. I think that uh, they're going to use him a lot, especially with how big some of the centers are going to get in the Western conference. Um, so I am picking Ross Neal to be my MVP. Good choice. All right, guys. Well, let's finish off with our. I put them down on the script as power rankings, and then we had a discussion about it. And it's not going to be technically power rankings, but it's going to be what do we think the Western Conference standings are going to look like at the end of the season? So, uh, Stu, let's start with you. Who do you have? What from look if whichever way? If you want to start from the bottom up, or yeah, yeah. go bottom up. Make bottom it, up. Yeah. Make it interesting. Go bottom up. Okay. Um, in sixth place, I'm going to say Utah. As I've said, we've already talked about their um, issues in uh, previous games, and I don't think this is going to be their season. I think they will be able to get um, more than one win in a row. So, But at the same time, I'm going to say that they are pipped out to fifth by Houston. Then I think the gap between first and fourth will be down to a matter of points compared to fifth and sixth. I think it'll I think the entire Western Conference is going to be much closer than 2020 led us to believe. So I am going to say in fourth is Austin. And now this is going to be my controversial pick that in third and missing out on the MLR shield is Seattle. Uh, second, I'm going to say it's the new boys. It's going to be Los Angeles. And then first, even though they've had a few changes, I still see the consistent work ethic being shown that San Diego will host the conference final for the Western Conference. All right, all right, all right. That's fair. Um, yeah, okay. This will be an interesting conversation. All right. Um, I think I'll kind of go. I'm kind of going the same way, to be honest. I'm going to go, or somewhat similar. Right? Not even really. No, not similar at all. Um, <laughs> what what a journey of a of, of a <laughs> sentence there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I say six Houston, five Utah. And then I'm kind of with Stu on the idea that I think one to four will actually, I honestly think one to four will be pretty tight. 
Um, oh, yeah. I'm going to go, though. I'm going to jumble this order up to make it a little bit more interesting. I'm going to go. I'm going to say in Austin tops mm-hmm. the conference. Okay. I'm going to go Austin, and then I'm going to say healthy Ben Sema. Seattle comes back and gets second because they've never been the they've, as you mentioned they've never been the top team, but I think they'll get that. And then no particular order. I think it'll be tight between San Diego and LA, and they'll battle for that playoff spot. But I'm going to go with like I feel like like Seattle. By the way, I'm thinking like Seattle makes the playoffs by like like a couple of points. Like it's not going to be yeah. like there's not going to be like a huge. Discrepancy. There's going to be no gaps. It's going to be tight. I think it's going to. I think like remember like the remember what the standings looked like in 2019. When it was like we go into like the last day, and it's like there was like five teams. when and you're in. Like there was like five teams that could make like the last two playoff spots or something. It was nuts, right? I feel like yeah, yeah. I feel like you might see something similar. Um, but I'm gonna go if I have to predict it. I'll go with Seattle and Austin make the playoffs, and then I think that's the one thing. Like I said, like this year, man, it's like you're gonna have legitimately good teams missing the play. Like you have Miss to, him. you have to be a yeah, you're gonna have legitimately good teams missing the playoffs, and I think, like, I think, I think, in, for me, I think like saying Seattle's gonna make the playoffs is a little bit of like, a little bit of like the emotional pick, which is kind of like crushing a little bit of the analytical part of my brain. There's a little bit of like the heart kind of crushing the brain a little bit. I think like, like they are the champs, and I think in a weird way, I'm like, I f- have a feeling that it's like. I just I don't know. I have a feeling they're gonna make you rip the shield out of their hands this year. Like I don't think they're gonna just kneel yeah. it up. Um for me it's six Houston, uh five Utah, four LA, three Seattle. I don't think that they're making the playoffs this year. All right, well, I have faith. Two San Diego and top of the table is Austin. Yeah. I think that they've got a combination of the new guys coming in that are going to provide a little bit more power to their punch, but they have enough consistency from the last couple of years from some key positions that are going to keep them to the top. Drinking the Gilgronis. I feel confident in this decision. Everything else. Like, I think oh. that you can switch Utah or you go in Seattle pretty easily. LA, I think has a chance to sniff in there, but I am pretty confident in this decision. I am also confident, but I also realistically fully know and I'm fully prepared for Houston and Utah to make the playoffs. <laughs> fully prepared. I don't know, but they will. They, they, All right, guys. And Austin, well, this was... that's probably that's the most likely outcome based on what we just said. You know what's yeah, great well, is you can bet on you can hold recurse by now. So don't listen to anything we said. Probably pick Utah, Utah, Houston, make the playoffs. Austin's gonna finish last again. Um, based on the fact that we just picked the exact opposite of that. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that was that was a great recap, and uh, we will be doing the Eastern Conference and focusing on the arrows next week, right before the season starts. Um, if you guys want to listen to some of our player interviews. Uh, it's been a, been a fantastic little journey leading up to 2021. So feel free to go back into the archives and listen to some of our interviews. And uh, if you want to give us a great review on any of the podcast platforms or on YouTube, you know, feel free to, and we love any of the support that you guys give us. And you guys have done a great job with that. And gentlemen, we are like, I can, I can smell the new season. It's, it's almost there. We're so close.